when this uh, conference was scheduled several weeks ago, I think the focus was meant to be on Obama's war on whistleblowers, uh, shown most dramatically by his nine prosecutions of leakers, several of them whistleblowers, three times as many under the Espionage Act as all previous administrations put together. And I have some authority to speak about that issue, uh, not as a lawyer, but as a defendant. I was the first person of those three before Obama, the first ever to face prosecution for a leak. And uh, the word whistleblower wasn't very common then. I wasn't, don't even remember being called it at that point. But uh, I would fit the definition that's been used more recently. And uh, I understand I've carried on uh, quite a study of the law since then. And so it's in that spirit that I'm prepared to say that as a member of the advisory board of ex post fact, I'm proud to say, and also uh, a board member of a group that is providing a uh, secure drop, an encryption method for anonymity for possible whistleblowers to expose fact, something that I think is essential now, we've found. Um, a board on the Freedom of the Press Foundation, on which I share, by the way, proudly with Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, and Edward Snowden. And um, in that spirit, obviously, uh, with uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation and Exposed Facts, encouraging whistleblowing, including so-called national security whistleblowing, uh, not only that, corporate, other methods, uh, social. Um, the, uh, and let, let me just mention very briefly something that doesn't get mentioned so much. I noticed in the handout here the emphasis on corporate whistleblowing uh, as well. And in that context, I would like to say this, just from my own uh, experience in the government, uh, not in corporations. But I say with very great confidence that the analytical departments of the fossil fuel, coal, gas, and uh, ener en energy countries, I am certain, have internal analyses which correspond in every detail with the most fatalistic analyses put forth by Bill McKibben or James Hansen or anyone else or the people who will be marching in September 21st uh, for uh, climate or regular real action against climate change. I'm sure that just like the tobacco companies, which secretly had analyses showing that their product was carcinogenic uh, and addictive and that they were uh, selling it to teenagers, which they were lying about under oath in front of the Congress, just as they had analyses totally backing that up, I'm certain that the corporate uh, corporations on the oil companies know what they're doing to the environment. And uh, as they continue to deny it and to fund uh, uh, institutions that create doubt about uh, scientific aspects of which there is very little doubt. Just put that aside to show that we're not talking only about the government, but of course I'll be focusing on so-called national security whistleblowing. I think now, as of the last two days, there's a more urgent need for what we called for earlier on in this press conference for more whistleblowing in that area. And I won't beat around the bush here at all. I believe that that means we need and must have right now, not years from now, uh, revelations of internal analyses of the costs, consequences, uh, the prospects for the military measures that we're being, the House and the Senate now are being asked to endorse. The others from inside the Pentagon, those are undoubtedly classified. I'm sure that many of them are highly realistic and correspond exactly to the objections raised by the 175 people who voted against uh, the measure yesterday uh, for aid to the Syrian rebels. And I'm saying that people inside who have that should consider right now revealing that to the Congress and to the public, those analyses, even though they will risk unjust prosecution under the Espionage Act. 18 U.S.C. 793, paragraphs D and E, which I can roll off because I was the first person indicted under those and kept up with it, and 798, the Communications Intelligence Act, which Snowden is accused of violating. And I'm saying those would be unjust prosecutions, and I'm prepared to discuss this at any length, uh, but I won't do so right now in my opening statements, that uh, when I say unjust, they're because they are being interpreted now by the Obama administration.
using them, as I say, more profitably than any other previous administration against leakers, act, uh, acts that were never intended to be used against disclosures against, uh, to the American public, but against spies to foreign countries. The use of them against leakers and, and whistleblowers is being interpreted as a strict liability law, uh, meaning that no discussion of motive, intention, possible harm, or actual harm is to be allowed in the courtroom. Uh, which is to say, by the way, that when uh, Secretary of State John Kerry uh, and previous Secretary of State Hillary Clinton have each said separately that Edward Snowden should come back uh, because he could then argue his case in court and to the public. Both of those are false. As far as the public is concerned, Edward Snowden would be in the same isolation type of cell that Chelsea Manning was in for ten and a half months until public protest uh, got her out into a general prison population, now for 35 years. Uh, Snowden would be in that isolation from the moment he arrived till the end of his life. And he would no more be able to make his case to the public than Chelsea Manning has been able to do in the four years she has been incarcerated. No reporter has been allowed to speak with her during that time. That would be true for Edward Snowden. As far as making his case, that's so much for making it in public. In court, as I just said, he would face the same objections that I faced, Chelsea Manning faced, Thomas Drake, and every other person uh, who has been in court in connection with a violation, alleged violation of the Espionage Act. He would face the same objection to uh, making any case whatever for what he had done. I was asked, why did you give the Pentagon Papers? Objection. My lawyer said, after trying several times to get through after these objections had been sustained, on the grounds that they were irrelevant to the case, motive was not an element, etc. My lawyer said in a good deal of frustration, Your Honor, this is the first time I've ever heard of a case, uh, ever seen a case, where the defendant was not allowed to tell the jury why he did what he did. And the judge said, Judge Byrne said, well, you're hearing one now. <laughs> so uh, Kerry and Hillary uh, Clinton are simply wrong on this. I actually was in a discussion chat log with Ed Snowden and asked him, do you think they believe what they're saying? And he said, no, no, they're lawyers. They know better than that. But I'm not so sure. Really, not many lawyers do know this. There have been so few cases prior to Obama. But this is the time with Obama and his successors for whom he set the precedent. This is the time for newsmen, newspersons, and journalists, uh, and uh, judges, and lawyers in general to become familiar with the constitutional aspects of this. The best constitutional lawyers on freedom of the, uh, the law of information in my day and for years after, Melville Nimmer, Harold Edgar, Benno Schmidt, all wrote that in their judgment, the uh, 18 U.S.C. 793 D&E should be held unconstitutional for overbreath. That uh, in putting beyond the realm of public discussion any release of documents that had been labeled classified was an overbroad violation of free speech and freedom of the press under the First Amendment and should be regarded as unconstitutional. And I regard that as the best judgment right now. In other words, uh, I keep hearing is, uh, uh, you know, about whether Ed Snowden is uh, clearly a criminal, but is he a patriot or a traitor? Well, I've been very offended by the, the traitor notion. Uh, he's no more a traitor than I am, and I'm not, as uh, now uh, Senator, former Senator Kerry, and now Secretary of State, actually, uh, just uh, testified. He didn't regard me as a traitor, but anything but a patriot. I think that's absolutely true of Snowden. And if exposed fact had existed, at the time that Snowden decided to reveal his revelations about NSA, I would hope that he would have uh, given them to expose fact, which would uh, address them with a very distinguished board of advisors, uh, go over the what, which ones they thought needed to be public or should be public, use that judgment, give it to newspapers if appropriate, who would be, as Snowden asked them to do, did ask them in the absence of Snowden uh, of exposed fact, ask the newspapers to use their own judgment as to what should be out, not trust his judgment entirely. Uh, Exposed Facts hopes to uh, provide a new channel for that to happen. Now, all that is on the, as I say, the, uh, I had expected to go a little more into the legal aspects, which is a little known, and I can talk about that later if you want. But as of the last two days, 
there is a new reason that I uh, feel it's a very appropriate for me to stand before you, uh, not just as, an, as a former defendant on this issue, but as a, a kind of authority on another subject. Uh, I noticed that the Times today, the New York Times, made a point of saying that in the vote yesterday uh, on the, uh, what they called the slippery slope to war in the Middle East, including ground troops ultimately, almost surely, almost, not certainly, but almost surely, and a very much enlarged war. Uh, they mentioned that only one third of the present House, not just the voting part, but only a third of the House had been in Congress to vote the last time there was a vote for a war, the Iraq War. It'd be very interesting to me to see a breakdown of how those people voted the 30 percent, the one third that were actually here to have that in their in their experience, in their background. <coughs> uh, one of them, Duncan Hunter, uh, who was, uh, was not in Congress, but he was in Iraq and Afghanistan as a Marine, voted against the resolution strongly, uh, among others, who said, we don't know where this ends, uh, how it's going to lead, where it's come to. One person who was in Congress and does remember, voted against the resolution, of course, is Barbara Lee from my own area, not my congresswoman, but I support her very strongly from Oakland, who of course was the one member of the House or Senate who voted against the, so the uh, uh, authorization for use of military force in 2001. One person uh, on the grounds that it had not been debated adequately, that many questions had not been answered, that this was basically an unconstitutional process in the way that Senator Morse and I'll come to that in a moment, had voted against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution many years earlier on the same grounds, that it was an unconstitutional delegation of power to a president, even though it was a formal vote, but an undated declaration of war, a broad authority here, which he, uh, Morse had argued and Lee also argued, was not constitutional for Congress to be giving the president that uh, broad uh, blank check, actually, for war that Article I, Section 8 called for that to be the responsibility of the Congress. Now, talking of Iraq, I would say Barbara Lee's judgment was very well supported. She was right. All the rest of Congress was wrong on that point. The next year, with the authorization of the use of military force, 2002, uh, she and Den then Dennis Kucinich uh, led, I think, as I recall, 128, maybe Somebody can correct me, but I think it was 128 people uh, in the House who voted against that one. Both of those authorizations are still being relied on, and the White House is saying now that uh, they don't need further authorization to go into Syria, actually, because of those authorizations. And for that same reason, then Barbara Lee, who does remember that history, um, is saying, don't do this again. Basically, let's see, the uh, fact quote, oh, there we go. Yeah yesterday was, uh, I'm reminded of the failure to have a thorough and robust debate in the wake of 9-11, that act of atrocity, that act of terrorism, which uh, frightened people into uh, a very hasty and premature uh, delegation of their powers. Now we have two beheadings on uh, television to do that and a call for a revenge act. And the overly broad authorization, which I could not vote for because it was a blank check for perpetual war. She could not. Everybody else could, but she couldn't. She was right. It is still on the books and is being used to authorize the strikes taking place now. This resolution should be repealed. And she said it is more complex than what the White House is saying. Just an up and down vote on arming and training members of the Free Syrian Army. The cons this is Barbara Lee. The consequences of this vote, whether it's written in the amendment or not, will be a further expansion of a war currently taking place and our further involvement in a sectarian war. And this without adequate debate or any vote in Congress having to do with the, the larger issues here of the war, which I just noticed uh, in the floor above, I saw Jim McGovern arguing. Uh, for the, that Congress must address and debate now instead of going home, I think he's saying, uh, the implications of this larger war that's coming. Okay, what's 
what's my qualification here? Well, I'll tell you uh, to speak about this. At 83, which is my age, uh, I don't know how many people in Congress are that old. There might be some. There have been, certainly. I wonder if there are any in Congress who were in Congress in 1975 when we finally ended the Vietnam War, or 73 when we ended the ground combat part of it. Uh, I am old enough to remember that and had an involvement in there, which uh, much of which I'm not proud of, but which uh, gives me some experience to deal with. In 19, uh, 2002, when Barbara Lee was leading this effort to uh, um, uh, vote against the authorization for the use of military force in Iraq, which, by the way, John Kerry yesterday described as a success story, that his, his standards have uh, have changed quite a bit since he was first a hero of mine when he was throwing his medals uh, over the White House wall and saying to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee the question, who will ask the last man, who wants to ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? And he was, he played a very credible role at that point, which uh, is, is long behind him, I'm sorry to say. Um, when Kerry voted for the Iraq authorization because he was going to run for president and he didn't want to be accused of having done nothing uh, in connection with this war, as did the other presidential candidates, including Hillary Clinton, uh, I think it was Hillary Clinton at that time, uh, certainly John Edwards even, and uh, a number of others. But in <coughs> arguing against it, I think there were 26 senators, including uh, Kerry's uh, fellow senator from Massachusetts, Ted Kennedy. There were only two members of the Senate who had been in the Senate to vote for the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which had two senators voting against it, no one in the House. Two remained, Ted Kennedy and Byrd, Robert Byrd. And each of them used the word, I am ashamed of that vote. I beg you, this is a close paraphrase, I plead with you, I beg you, do not make the mistake we made years ago on the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. And their <coughs> pleas were heard, as I say, by, by 26 uh, altogether uh, senators voting against that, but it went ahead. And it was not a success story, as we all know, uh, which is why we're dealing with the problems we are today. Now, I was 50 years ago and six weeks ago in the Pentagon on August 4th, 1964, August 1964, 50 years ago. Spent all night in the Pentagon uh, watching the first raids against North Vietnam, which were the precursors to seven years of bombing and almost four times the tonnage of World War II dropped on Indochina. Over eight million tons of bombs compared to two million in World War II. I was there that night to watch those raids, and I watched my president saying, and my boss, the Secretary of Defense, I was a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary, my first day in the Pentagon, coincidence. I watched them saying to the public, uh, we have unequivocal evidence. They were referring, by the way, in particular to an NSA, uh, an NSA intercept, which had been misinterpreted, misunderstood, understood by NSA within a day or two to have referred to an earlier attack, not to the attack they alleged had just happened. And NSA did not correct that mistake in its own files for 40 years. I have here with me a study by Robert Yanyak, Hanyak from NSA showing that it was clearly uh, possible to find out that not only had there been mistranslations and misfiling and misunderstandings of this which was given to the president, but that they had persisted in concealing that error by other lies and concealment for 40 years. And Hanyak, when he revealed this in his study, which I can give you references to if you want, in 2001 for NSA, at a, first at a, at a level higher than top secret, tried to get it declassified in 2001 and 2002. At first, they said, fine, 40 years old, time to tell the truth on this. We can, we can put your study out. 
And then in 2002, they realized in NSA, it looks too much like what's happening this year in Iraq with the WMDs, so they wouldn't declassify it until someone leaked about it to Matthew Aid in 2005. I just spoke yesterday to Scott Shane, who then wrote a New York Times story in October of 2005, saying there is this study here which says that we were lied into war and that NSA was complicit. NSA was culpable throughout that period, uh, probably of deceiving the president at first, but then deceiving everybody after that when the truth became known in NSA. It says, says all this. Um, Scott Shane wrote the story. And they declassified the study with a few redactions a month later and, and said, by the way, oh, it has no relation to Scott Shane's leak or story. We were about to do this anyway after four years uh, the next month, working night and day. Okay, I was misled that first night. I thought there probably had been an attack. But when they said unequivocal evidence, and I, I won't take time now to go into this whole story, I knew that was a flat lie. Nothing could be more equivocal. It wasn't certain there had been no attack that night, but it was certain that it was uncertain. Uh, Commander Herrick, Commodore Herrick on the spot had said, recommend no action be taken till further uh, reconnaissance, which was done the next morning and revealed nothing. He said, take no action, everything is too uncertain, uh, whether there's an attack or not. But the president wanted to show Goldwater that he could be tough. He didn't want to face the charge in an ongoing presidential campaign uh, that he would let us be attacked, like letting two people be beheaded or something like that, uh, and do nothing. So this was a good excuse, and if there was some evidence that we had a reason to go, that was good enough. Second, he said, unprovoked, total lie, which I knew already the first uh, night, or certainly by the next day, unprovoked, we were conducting covert, illegal, aggressive operations against North Vietnam before all of these operations by the destroyers, and that had led to the actual attack two days early, earlier. Three, in international waters, very misleading again. Four, we seek no wider war. And that was the election campaign where facing Goldwater, retired, uh, not retired, reserve, Air Force Major General, who represented the views of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for a larger war than ever occurred, larger than ever occurred, uh, risking war with China, clearly, and indeed uh, possibly using nuclear weapons in Vietnam, something that cost them quite a bit with the voters. And in opposing that, Johnson was saying, we're not going to send American troops, American boys, he put in, then it was all boys, we're not going to send American boys to do what Asian boys should be doing. We're not going north, we're not sending troops. No ground troops is what he was heard to say. And essentially what he did say. Or what we just heard from the president uh, uh, ye yesterday, I guess it was, day before yesterday. So um, no ground troops, uh, good commitment. Actually what we were talking about then in the Pentagon was a wider war, full blast. Not as big as Goldwater's, but a big widening of the war, a big air war. That's what I was dealing with. On election day, I was in the State Department in an interagency group representing the Defense Department on widening the war with airstrikes. Why election day? Uh, didn't want it to be the day before. It might have leaked and affected the election. Didn't want it to be the day after because there was no time because the government of Vietnam, we were supposed to, which had nine heads uh, in the next, in the, that 12 month period, was so weak and so ready to collapse, we just couldn't wait to back it up with air power. But that was gonna be air power. Actually, McNamara and Maxwell Taylor still opposed ground troops, but the army didn't. And the army was making its plans for ground troops. And as soon as the air power, just air power, is going over. You know, that's something, as McNamara used to say, you can always stop. And but easier than troops, like drones, like airstrikes in Syria, like airstrikes in Iraq, just air power. They used to say in the Pentagon, pilots don't have mothers, which means what? It means they're volunteers, they're older, they have their own families, there are few of them, and if they get killed, as they did, or prisoners, you don't get a movement. Send 19-year-olds over there on the ground, that's the boots on the ground phrase. They have mothers. 
Drones, of course, don't even have fathers or mothers. So you can lose those, uh, no, no troops at risk. And so when you send them or airstrikes over Libya, it isn't even a war. So Congress that is facing this vote today didn't have a chance to vote on Libya. They weren't asked for one since, uh, since Iraq. This is their first vote uh, since, uh, uh, since Iraq. And of course, as Barbara Lee points out, it's not yet on a war. And there's a question whether they will ever ask them for authorization for a war. Okay, well, I'll close at this point. No ground troops. It's just air power, just in Iraq. Perfectly legal, internationally, no problem. Then, of course, the next day, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs suggests some disagreement with the Joint Chiefs here, possibly, uh, as was true in Vietnam. Uh, yes, he may recommend uh, troops. And uh, the Air White House has been trying to walk back a possible contradiction uh, between this. Say, well, it's not really ground troops. They're just going to be special operations troops. They, they don't have mothers either, I guess. And um, uh, just special operations. And they're just going to be in the front lines, but they won't be carrying a weapon. Some of them will not be carrying a weapon, doing uh, air spotting and so forth. But that isn't what General Dempsey was talking about. That isn't all that he's going to recommend. He says, if the air power is not adequate to do the job with the Iraqi troops, which, by the way, uh, who was it? Today, General Dempsey said, I mean, the next day, September 17th, half of the Iraqi army not competent to partner with the U.S. against ISIS. That's after over a decade of training them. Mm -hmm. So uh, will he says, if they don't need it, then he'll recommend ground troops. General Odiono. Chairman, I'm sorry, Chief of Staff of the Army, then says, you can't accomplish this task of defeating ISIS without ground troops. And he didn't say US ground troops, but who are they gonna be? You know, Syrian ground troops? Well, that's an, we can go into that another one. Iraqi, Jordan, maybe, Saudi Arabian. Um, those assurances by the President might be meant sincerely by him. He did reject a proposal for ground troops back in March. Is he telling us that every time General uh, Dempsey comes to him with the recommendant he's forecast, he will again reject? Always? That's what he's saying. I will, for the next two years I'm in here, turn back the united judgment of the Joint Chiefs uh, that we need ground troops in Iraq or Syria, uh, always. And I'll take the flack. If they leak it, if they resign, if they do whatever, that's all right. I will keep my commitment. Fat chance. The fact is, he might. It's possible. He might keep that and face impeachment charges, I would, I would bet, from the Republicans in the uh, House and Senate if he did that. But uh, one more, the last piece of experience here. Should we do nothing with ISIS? Well, I would suggest that what the president is doing is uh, precisely what will possibly acquit him of the charge that he did nothing mm -hmm. militarily. That's the objective. And it will be achieved. He can't say, I did nothing. It's not just General Soldaniono and uh, Dempsey that in the following proposition, I doubt there is a single person in the Pentagon or the, or the commands or the commands or the CIA who believes that President Obama can achieve the goals he has set out, committed us to as a president, to degrade and destroy ISIS with airstrikes alone in Iraq. Certainly not. I mean, they have, they, they're based in Syria largely. So the question of bombing Syria comes up as a sovereign country. There's a legal problem that our allies see, if we don't, about bombing a sovereign country without the consent of its ruler. But in Syria, that won't do it either. The Joint Chiefs are in effect saying, and I, well, I'm sorry, they will say, let me say from my experience in the Pentagon, they will say, uh, you can't do this, you can't achieve your objectives that you've announced to the public with airstrikes alone, period. As Odiono says, they have to be ground forces and they'll be US ground forces. 
He may not send them. He may accept stalemate and defeat in that effect, or he may do what Johnson did uh, under that kind of pressure. And that's so Barbara Lee is saying, we're facing a much larger war. Now, it may be that as in Vietnam, the Joint Chiefs are saying, it may be, we can do the job if you let us do it big enough. Put in the ground troops. Put in, uh, in both Iraq and Syria. Do all that. Then we can defeat ISIS. Maybe they're saying that, and maybe they're not. I would like people to be leaking right now what they're actually saying to the president and to each other on that point. But my guess is, if they are saying it, they're wrong again. The Joint Chief said, do what we ask you to do. It may cause war with China, may have to use nuclear weapons, but uh, we can do the job. I believe they were wrong. I'm glad it was not that was not tested from my experience. But in any case, we're looking at a job that, as the president has said, ISIS can't be solved, can't be dealt with militarily alone. But it needs U.S. leadership. Let me give another possibility. It can't be done with U.S. leadership and it can't be done at all by us militarily. It takes diplomatic and other dealings with the people who finance uh, uh, ISIS and who uh, support it in various ways, including our ally Saudi Arabia, who's going to do the training here of these forces. Uh, and I think people were expert. I suspect that CIA is probably saying exactly that, and it would be good for us to know it right now. And what may how in fact, uh, when I say, isn't it better to do something than nothing against these murderous, brutal thugs, which is what they are, fanatics, ideologues, ISIS, and so forth, expelled from Al-Qaeda. Actually, they're making Al-Qaeda look moderate now. <laughs> so uh, 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 don't we have to do something? Well, he's doing something, airstrikes. And according to the FBI yesterday, Comey FBI had said not. yesterday, US airstrikes increasing that support for ISIS. Um, Second, the uh, airstrikes in Syria, increasing support for ISIS in both Iraq and Syria. Oh, is that an amazing, uh, amazing uh, result? As a matter of fact, um, uh, ask yourself, why the public beheading? Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't put it on television for us when they behead people, as they do every month, one for sorcery recently. Uh, the Free Syrian Army doesn't put it on television when they behead people, as they've done uh, seven prisoners recently. Why did ISIS choose this moment to put on consecutive days, weeks, or something, a public beheading? Well, as Nick Kristof suggests, and these CIA things and other and the FBI confirm, they want U.S. airstrikes. Now, how could they want U.S. airstrikes? Well, they kill a lot of Iraqis, or Syrians, civilians, and others, and even when they kill ISIS. It shows that ISIS is leading the fight against the U.S. Nothing does it better. That's what these reports actually say. In other words, doing this something, military, easy, no U.S. casualties, uh, over there in an airstrike, we are strengthening ISIS, is the FBI. So doing something that makes things worse is not something you should vote in support of. Though that's what Kerry is asking us to do, finally. I have, I'm sorry, no, I know I've gone too long, no, but Norman, right. I, will, I have to quote one last thing, I'm sorry, from my Vietnam experience. Um, on April 6th, I, I remember that date actually, the day before my birthday, 34th birthday, I read in the Pentagon this is in my earlier book, Papers on the War, from the Pentagon Papers. April 6 announced that the President had decided to change the mission, on April 1st, April Fool's Day, to change the mission of U.S. ground troops, initially the Marines, to include offensive ground operations. Now the Marines, I, I could go on forever and I won't, uh, in March had been sent there my boss, I remember, said, oh my God, we're sending in the Marines. It's got to be anybody but the Marines. That means a commitment. <coughs> I'm a former Marine. And he tried to make it the Army, but it was too late uh, for me. So we sent the Marines in, but with the announcement, just to defend Da Nang for its air operations. Air operations, you know, those simple, harmless things that don't get us committed. So the Marines are there to defend. That was the public announcement. 
He changed that to offensive ground operations. I remember getting the, 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 the message on April 6th, secretly. And McGeorge Bundy, his national security assistant, predecessor to Henry Kissinger in this job, the president desires that premature publicity be avoided by all possible precautions. The actions themselves should be taken as rapidly as practicable, but in ways that should minimize any appearance of sudden changes in policy. They were going out from the base doing offensive op patrols, now, the kind I was trained to do as a rifle company commander. The president's desire is that these movements and changes in combat mission should be understood as being gradual and wholly consistent with existing policy. And I wrote a memo at that time inside as a cold warrior working on the war in Vietnam. I wrote a memo to my boss and said, this is dangerous. You can't keep that secret. There's reporters over there. They'll know what the Marines are doing and will be shown to be concealing it. You know, we've actually changed the whole nature of the war. We're taking over the war from the South Vietnamese. I don't think you can keep it uh, a secret that long. I was wrong. That was April, May, June. 100,000 troops were over there now, another 100,000 about to go. And uh, they're on offensive operations, of course. No word, no leak that there's been. So on July 28th, when the president finally announced that we were sending more troops, and actually, since I'd written the earlier speech, it was 100,000, but he announced 50,000 to make it look a little more palatable. So he announced 50,000, and he was asked this question. Mr. President, does the fact, this is July 28th now, uh, no, well, April, May, June, July, four months later, does the fact you are sending additional forces to Vietnam imply any change in the existing policy of relying mainly on the South Vietnamese to carry out offensive operations, your Syrians, Army, Iraqi, and using American forces to guard installations and to act as an emergency backup? President LBJ, it does not imply any change in policy whatever. It does not imply change of objective. And as I wrote, <coughs> that was true. The policy had been changed four months earlier. They just hadn't announced it. I'll end with this question. When General Dempsey, as he has forecast, recommends that people be put, American <coughs> troops, ground troops be put, not in battalion headquarters or brigade headquarters, but in the front lines, calling down air missions, and perhaps accompanying <coughs> them on combat <coughs> missions. When he makes that recommendation, will it be announced? And when the president accepts it, if he does, will we hear it? No. Why? Why would we? Because uh, President Obama is less secretive than Lyndon Johnson or Nixon? Actually, he isn't. So uh, when they say, in other words, this is, should be considered as a, a question of getting into war, deserves that kind of attention and debate and questions being answered, it deserves all that and it will not happen without whistleblowers telling the truth that the generals are unwilling to pass on to Congress. The lack of whistleblowers in 1964 and 65, and I was part of that lack, caused us Vietnam. The lack of whistleblowers, the lack of an Edward Snowden or a Chelsea Manning in high levels in 2002 cost us Iraq. So what the meaning of this poster here about the don't do what I did, I'm talking about don't do what I did in 64, 65. Don't wait before you, until thousands more have died, till you tell the truth with documents that reveal lies or crimes or internal projections of costs and dangers. You might save a war's worth of lives. You will also risk, despite the use of exposed fact, there's not riskless, will do the best to, expo to, uh, to minimize the risks of exposure, and it should be done anonymously, in my opinion, unless you're prepared to go into exile, like Edward Snowden. Uh, it should be done. You will risk prosecution under the Espionage Act, and you will, if that happens, you will you will not be able to argue any of your motives. So the risks are very great, but they're worth a war's worth of lives right now. And that's why I don't hesitate to ask people to consider doing that. Thank you.
Uh, so we have time for a few questions, and because this is being uh, taped in full, uh, we'll briefly summarize the questions. Uh, anybody have, uh, have a question you want to ask? Yes? Yeah, I'm Charlie Clark with Government Executive. Uh, oh, oh. Charlie Clark with Government Executive uh, Media Group. Uh, if someone in the Pentagon leaked the cost and consequences analyses, would that also help uh, ISIS? Would, would, also, would help. also help the uh, ISIS? Um, and, and do you want to summarize the yeah, question? For yeah, the question is, if he were to reveal those costs and whatnot, would that help ISIS? Well, if it, um, what I'm saying is that what's happening, what has happened for the last 13 years in the way of military actions and expenditures by the U.S. to this day, including this day, every bit of that has led to the creation of ISIS, and the ex every expansion of it now since ISIS existed has strengthened ISIS. Now, if it kept, if that exposure kept us out of there, that would be against the wish of ISIS, as I've already suggested here. Uh, keeping us out of there would, in fact, uh, uh, make a case now for dealing with other people uh, with interests in the region and other stakes to limit the funding, to uh, stigmatize ISIS, to isolate them. But so long as they are permitted to have the, uh, the appearance based on reality that they are the most aggressive and effective leaders of a struggle against the U.S., everything we do strengthens them. And you know, I, I, I'm, since since I'm talking about my Vietnam experience, let me let me give you one aspect uh, from my experience in the field. I was in 38 of the 42 uh, provinces, 43 provinces of Vietnam, and I concluded and reported that the major recruiting tool for the Viet Cong, after years of war with a very war weary public who wanted that war over whoever won at that point. Uh, the major recruiting tool for them was our attacks on villages in South Vietnam. They would fire, one person or two people would fire from a village at an American airplane. That would bring down an American airstrike and I have flown in an observation plane during one of those airstrikes onto that village, which would, as the Viet Cong figured, send many of the people there, the women and children, into fetid, swampy, refugee camps and the young men into the jungle with the Viet Cong, people who had not previously gone. It was the recruiting tool. It is the recruiting tool now. If there's something to be learned from that experience, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, where Matthew Ho, H-O-H, uh, said exactly the same thing, uh, that's, the, that's the lesson. Can you compare the way the media has treated the issue of whistleblowers, maybe treated you versus uh, Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden? You know, the, the, the well, how, okay, how has the media treated you people treated me? Well, I've been treated very well in the last couple of years, since uh, 2010, since Chelsea Manning came out, better than ever before, ever, and certainly better than the last 30 years or so. Um, there's more talk of Daniel Ellsberg, like as Kerry has said, the patriot, the, the right whistleblower, the way to do it, and so forth. Uh, of course, I was facing 115 years in prison, called a traitor by the president and the vice president, and a lot of other people, and uh, just like Snowden, and um, uh, was saved from prison probably by an amazing, miraculous set of events which exposed the Nixon administration to possible impeachment. But, uh, so I was very lucky. But uh, I was treated, in other words, at the, at the time, pretty much the way Snowden is treated now. So all of a sudden, I have become a great uh, pa patriot, and uh, the, right, the right way to do it, as, as Hillary also uh, mentioned this, uh, in contrast to Snowden. To, in other words, in a way of stigmatizing Snowden is different from him. Of course, there are differences in every single case. Uh, I don't recognize those differences as significant uh, at all. I identify entirely with the motives and uh, the uh, instincts, the, the actions of Chelsea Manning and uh, Snowden, which isn't to say, by the way, that they've done nothing wrong, they didn't everything perfect, or made no mistakes, whatever. Uh, any more than, than that could be said of me. But, um, for example, 
in my case, I very much regret, that, uh, regret, that's the message of this, that I did not provide the Pentagon Papers when they would have done the most good at the time Congress was voting on this and at the time the escalation was occurring. I regret that very much. So I'm saying, don't do what I did. Don't wait. Senator Morse, in 71, seven years after the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, one of the two who voted against it, said to me, Ellsberg, after the Pentagon Papers had come out, if you'd given me those documents in 64, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution would never have come out of committee. And if they had bypassed the committee and sent it to the floor, it would never have passed. Well, that's pretty, putting a pretty heavy weight on me. But I had to admit, I was one of the hundred or more people who could have given the contents of my safe, which I am asking right now, not just the random contents, not most of the contents. I didn't have, uh, I had a dozen safes practically full of stuff, but about one drawer of selected documents, actually, that revealed that the president was totally deceiving the government at that, public at that time, into a hopeless war, a war that, as his own joint chiefs believed, could never be won at the level he was willing to do it, which is, I'm sure, what they're feeling right now. Okay, I should have revealed that. So I have my regrets. And I don't know what Snowden or Chelsea Mannings may be, but uh, I absolutely, as I say, applaud what we've learned from them. And I am asking for people to follow their example, uh, not only my example, because it's the same. Yeah. Hey, um, my name is Morten Brackles, I'm a journalist from Norway. Uh, I'm sorry? I'm a journalist from Norway. Uh, I have two questions, if I may. You mentioned uh, that Obama has prosecuted more journalists and whistleblower than anyone previously. Could you just tell, uh, explain to an international audience the climate for whistleblowing and investigative journalism in the US right now? Yes, see, okay. I've been looking into that. The, the question is the, the climate internationally for whistleblowing. And it varies a good deal. Um, uh, I, for example, I've been asked to Japan. I'm not able to do it right now because of a, a book I'm reading. But uh, they just passed a very harsh uh, whistle, anti-whistleblowing, uh, anti-leak law, like the Official Secrets Act. And that there's a large movement in Japan to try to get that reversed. And that's why they're, uh, they were asking me to come over and, and talk. Uh, there's a good article by that. Uh, about that by Morton H. Halperin recently. I can give you the reference later if you want. Um, also, uh, there was a study, I saw recently a study of 15 different countries. Canada has, for example, a pretty good uh, a law which allows for a public accountability defense uh, recently. By the way, what I'm saying is that a law like the British Official Secrets Act, and the British, by the way, rescinded an earlier provision calling for a public, allowing a public interest defense. And they, uh, uh, meaning that they, you'd done something for public benefit, what I was not allowed to argue in my case, and Snowden would not be allowed. I'm saying that a law in this country with the First Amendment, uh, without the ability to argue a public interest defense, or as Yohai Benkler of Harvard has just written a very good article this summer, which I can give you the reference to, uh, on the public accountability defense. Without that, the law should be regarded in this country as unconstitutional. In other countries, they don't have a First Amendment, but again, they need whistleblowers as much as we do. As, as a matter of fact, Snowden is right now in a controversy with New Zealand, where the heads of New Zealand were saying, oh, we don't do any mass surveillance of our citizens, and uh, Snowden said, they're lying. Uh, this was in the last week. And today I saw that the Norwegian Prime Minister said, well, he may be right, but we're not cooperating. Well, Snowden says, no, that's still false. They are cooperating, totally. Okay, they need whistleblowers over there, not only Snowden. Uh, basically what it comes down to is many countries have an act like the British Official Secrets Act, which criminalizes any or all um, release of classified information without a question of motive. Um, the, uh, we didn't have, we've never passed such an act and signed it. Congress passed such an act in November of 2000 for the first time, and Clinton vetoed it on constitutional grounds. 
and I won't ask for hands here, but I'll guess in this audience of journalists, I'd be surprised if there's more than one or two who, who know what I just said, the his that little history. Now, let me ask for hands. Who, who knew what I just said? That an official secrets act was passed for the first time, well, right, <laughs> Conrad, uh, but, uh, <laughs> and I know just a little bit again. She didn't raise her hand. But um, uh, anyway, little known, that's why I say people need to know more about this. The reason we didn't have it is because of the First Amendment. And Obama now is using the act as if it were a British Official Secrets Act. See, that was done against me, but the case fell apart. It's done against APAC, the case fell apart. One conviction earlier on that, Samuel Lauren Morris in 1985. Nine, nine people under Obama, several of them not particularly whistleblowers, leakers, but uh, several of them definitely whistleblowers like Tom Drake, Chelsea Manning, and Edward Snowden, who's under indictment. Uh, so the uh, Congress needs to pass a Public Accountability Act, Public Interest Act. What's the chance? I'd like to know more. Uh, small, I would say, at this point, but definitely worth doing. And the effect of Obama's prosecutions, which have not been upheld yet by the Supreme Court, basically these prosecutions have been held to extort plea bargains from people for fear of even further expense, further uh, adjudication, which they can't afford, uh, rather than allow them to go up to the Supreme Court, which has never, never ruled on this subject. Do I think if it went up that a majority of judges today would, would call that unconstitutional, as I think they would have in, 70, in the early 70s? Probably not. Probably what I'm saying uh, would be agreed to only by four justices, so the Supreme Court. Nevertheless, uh, I, I think what the, the, the point of this in a way is the purpose of threatening that act and using it all these years has been to stigmatize people who tell the truth about crimes and lies as being criminals. And I say they're not criminals. They are not violating a law uh, that is constitutional. Uh, people who uh, were tried for disobeying the Dred Scott Act, you know, the Dred Scott uh, law, for example, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act, were doing what they should have done. And the people who, uh, who have put out these information what's in, in this country or other countries, Russia, China. By the way, it, it seems to be very little notice that uh, WikiLeaks, when it started, was concentrating on totalitarian regimes, in particular China. And that for several years, it's WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, was publishing mainly um, uh, whistleblowing uh, from essentially totalitarian regimes or otherwise autocratic regimes like Kenya, but China and other places, till he finally, uh, till Chelsea Manning finally turned up uh, in this. So I'm saying we need that. We need an equivalent to WikiLeaks in this country. Exposed facts uh, will be um, in the same line, though, as you pointed out, we want to learn from all the previous experience. It's going to be very carefully uh, edited. Uh, chosen, gone over by an advisory board, uh, which of course WikiLeaks was accused of not doing adequately, and, and as well as the judgment of newspapers. So, uh, and I can give you references later on the. We might, uh, we might have time for one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Is there one more? Yes. Uh, sir, but this my name is Jacques. I'm with uh, Lebanese TV and Medellin. With Lebanese TV and Medellin. The discrepancy of, uh, of official Washington statements on ISIS just mushrooms day, day in and, and day out. It's the discrepancy of official statements. Yes. The size of ISIS that has been revealed only speaks of 30,000 members, fighters. Now, it's inconceivable to imagine that 30,000 can cause so much grief and despair throughout, when indeed it was a byproduct, as the U.S. is beginning to say, as in today's New York Times, ISIS was a byproduct of the forces the U.S. invasion brought from Afghanistan, the Taliban. So there is some parallel between the two, just like you said. And the last thing is, 
the uh, oh, yeah. uh, financial backers of ISIS have always been revealed to be Saudis. They've been okay. Saudis, yeah. Saudi money. Yeah. So that's never been uh, a secret. Now, why is the U.S. itself not focusing on that aspect when it comes to ISIS? Well, uh, by the way, you were talking about discrepancies. I noticed that uh, two official sources uh, I was just noticing today, one, I think it's in the Times, one said 30,000, the other said 20,000 of ISIS, but either one, by the way, either of which looks a good deal larger than the 5,000 uh, people we are proposing to have trained a year from now in Saudi Arabia. And the question being raised, of course, is that when we arm them and train them, where will their arms end up since the people we've what, we've been, what the CIA has been sending for years now in a covert war to Syria has largely ended up with ISIS, or, and the units themselves have often changed ISIS. And it goes back to the point I was raising earlier. Why does ISIS want U.S. airstrikes? Why would they even prefer some more ground troops in, against the mere you know, 20,000 or 30,000 people and so forth? And that's because it's not as though they can defeat the United States of America in one year or two years or 10 years, but in the long war that's being promised for us, they can be fairly confident that we will not defeat them, certainly if we limit it to Iraq, Iraq or to Syria, or if we go into Syria. We're not going to defeat them because as we kill X number of them plus 10 times that number of civilians, they are replaced and enlarged. They grow larger, as we found in the Viet Cong. Underestimating them though they were, they got bigger every year in line with our, with our troops because our troops and our air power in particular was recruiting for them. And, uh, and uh, the stories here, again, I saw them just today, uh, that um, uh, the fact that we come into this war say in Syria, radicalizes Syrians to join ISIS, the people, the moderates, the people we want to help, supposedly. And by the way, just one other little point that's in today's, today's paper. Uh, the announcement that we are going to um, uh, help, uh, fight ISIS, do airstrikes, ultimately in Syria, has led Assad who is doing most of the war against ISIS up till now, to stop his airstrikes against ISIS and concentrate on the, quote, moderate rebels, the ones we're going to arm, who oppose both Assad and, and uh, ISIS. Now, why would he do that? Because we're going to attack ISIS for him. He wants to attack the other people that we might arm against him. And when he's disposed of them, and this is in all the stories now, Assad figures we'll have to go to Assad for help because he's the only force fighting ISIS for those troops on the ground. Odiono says, have to be troops on the ground. Whose troops will they be? He has stepped up in the last three days, in the last three days, since the uh, last week, since these announcements were made, effectively his airstrikes against the moderates, which have, as I say, two effects. It, it kills them, the ones we're trying to help. It makes them less moderate and apt to join ISIS, and in any case, uh, it leaves Assad as the only force against ISIS. So you can say, what is going on here? Uh, all I can see is that those people who are interested in endless war in this region uh, are being benefited by our military measures, and if there's a diplomatic solution, if there's any solution, if there's any kind of solution to ISIS, and there could be, it has to be diplomatic with allies, actually, and others. That means changing our relation to Saudi Arabia <coughs> and f ceasing to tolerate their supplying moderates and radicals, all the Muslim insurgents against us, ceasing to uh, stop this uh, Wahhabi proselyting all over the world with uh, the U.S. as the great Satan, basically. Uh, and uh, we've really got to change our relation with them. Now, that's hard to do. They've got a lot of oil over there. And uh, Bush wasn't going to do that, and we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing Obama do it. But that that has to be in the future, um, if there's going to be an answer to ISIS. Also, there has to be a change in our relations to Russia and Iran, I would say, in that area. 
uh, to consider the overall regional problems here and what assistance they could give in the way of cutting off supplies uh, to groups like uh, ISIS. They're, they're not for ISIS, they're backing Assad, but uh, the Russians. But uh, in general, other groups having a new relation of the U.S. to the Middle East. Not likely, but I think if we face realistically what we're being asked to get into here, uh, we have a chance of escaping the madness that was Iraq and Vietnam and doing it again indefinitely, indefinitely in uh, uh, the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria. As Barbara Lee said, will we be standing here 10 years from now about our next enemy in the Middle East? The answer is yes, under the current policy. So we've got to change that. We've got to change that. Thank you? Thank, thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah. Give me your card. I can send you a reference. I don't know where Norway is. You always go around. I don't know where Norway is on the official secret side. Do you know? No, I don't know. No one's been talking. He's trying to Why? Why? Oh, because I think he. I think. I don't know what individual in the world I would point to who's done more for democracy and, and ultimately then for ending these wars than Snowden by the courage that he showed in the steps that he took. What he showed here was not just an American problem. He's even been criticized for that. Why are you revealing surveillance all over the world? Because he wants to reveal it's not just an American problem. This is a global problem. Not only is NSA listening to everybody in the world, but they're cooperating with many other countries. And the other countries are doing it on their own if they're not cooperating. Uh, Putin says he's not doing it. And Snowden doesn't believe that. It doesn't believe that. And of course, China. Every country in the world is doing what they can. And it's a, you'd be surprised if Norway is not. But I don't know. What? We all cooperate. Is that right? You're not part of the five eyes. No, no, no. But, too small. Uh, what? We're too small. We're a tiny country. But you are cooperating with NSA? Do you have a reference on that? Well, the Norwegian papers have written that. What? The Norwegian papers have written that. But we can are you, could you, I'll give you a card. Yeah, could I'll, you uh, I tell me? I didn't know. Hmm. And look into the question of the uh, official secret side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Are you disappointed in Obama? I didn't expect much uh, at all from him. And uh, on the subject of civil liberties, I am very surprised. I did not expect this attack on whistleblowers. And I don't know anybody who has an explanation of it. Uh, you know, up till now, there was one reason I supported Obama in both campaigns. And I thought he was less likely to get us into war with Iran, uh, Iraq again, you know, Syria and so forth. And in that I'm not disappointed so far. He has been less likely, I think, and he's still more reluctant. If we had McCain in, if we had Romney in, we would have been at war for years now in these cases. So in that respect, I'm not disappointed. But of course, at this moment, it's changing. Uh, he seems to be under the pressure of a lot of people in the country who have been bulldozed into this by Fox News and others, and uh, by the dark chief. And I think like Lyndon Johnson, in a way, he's trying to do a middle course between the joint chiefs and the people in Congress who voted against this. Hmm. And, uh, but his middle course involves getting us into the war. The Just, now, Lyndon Johnson intended a much wider war. Hmm. I don't think that's true of Obama. That's a difference. That's a difference. But if McCain were to I think if Hillary Clinton were to he'd be in war. She's telling us. So I'm glad I supported him against Hillary Clinton. Hmm. I won't have good prospects if she, if she becomes the next president. But even worse, probably, we'll have to see if the Republicans can come up with somebody again. Even worse. And if they do, I'll support Hillary Clinton. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. I'm Mira David. I'm with RT News. Oh, yeah. RT. Oh, yeah. It's very, very good to have you. Just if you want to step down for one second, I just want to get a couple of questions with you. I would be more just to reiterate what you were already talking Say what? about. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, what's your of name? Some, Amira. Amira. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask you. Amira. 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 Amira.
I'm just letting you know I'm going to ask you a couple questions that you already spoke about because I want to get a closer on camera. Um, so, first of all, tell me why right now. Why, why, are you, why is it so timely? Can you can about facing an issue at a time like now. The lack of whistleblowers earlier gave us the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Whistleblowers could have uh, stopped either of those, and I'm very regretful that I was not a whistleblower in 64, 65, and they could have played that role. Uh, by the time I became a whistleblower in 71, we were many years into the war. It's very hard to do anything about it. This is the time, right now, on the edge of a long, endless, and eventually large war in the Middle East that will do no benefit to anyone, any more than Vietnam, or, except on its main terms. And, and also considering the right now, the Obama administration is targeting prosecuting more whistleblowers than any other administration combined. Are you concerned that there won't be anyone we can do? Is it working? Are you concerned that anyone uh, won't follow your footsteps? Won't be doing uh, what you're doing, especially now when we're talking about this well, escalation? Now that prosecution has been added by Obama to the real risks that whistleblowers are facing, it was much less true before Obama. There was pressure, of course, to have even fewer whistleblowers. On the other hand, the example of uh, what Edward Snowden has done in terms of the pressures for reform of NSA, which would not exist without him, I think that example may encourage people to say, this is something I must consider doing. I don't tell anyone, you are the person who must do this. I don't know their alternatives, I don't know their life situation, but I do say very broadly, the people in the government who know that the country is being lied into a war, or the major deceptions are occurring, or crimes, as in the case of torture, and uh, illegal and broad detention, or mass surveillance, that you should consider doing this, or revealing that, even at the risk of your own livelihood, your own imprisonment. And uh, in 2012, uh, President Obama, uh, or Congress, I should say, enacted something called the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. How do you reconcile something like that, which is really supposed to afford uh, more government employees' protection, yet at a time when he's at the same time prosecuting more people than any other administration? The Whistleblower Protection Act effectively doesn't uh, apply, especially to contractors like Edward Snowden. <coughs> but in particular to national, it doesn't apply really very much to classified information, and that's what I'm talking about. So a lot of other unclassified whistleblowing is very important, and that act may help. But in what I'm talking about, preventing a war, or preventing major constitutional abuses, uh, it really doesn't reach to it. And the Intelligence Protection uh, Whistleblowers Act uh, also provides some uh, uh, ability for intelligence people, not contractors, uh, to report, but essentially requires them to report to the Inspector General of their agencies. And that is a, a black hole, that is a route to their being uh, persecuted and fired and whatnot. Like it's no real protection there. One second, did you get the first question? Yeah, question? yeah. Um, so we may have not gotten the first question. I'm just going to ask you to repeat it because it was so beautifully said. But basically, I was asking you why do you think you should be, you know, why are you here? Why is it so important to be here talking about a whistleblowing issue at a time like now? We're right on the edge, the leading edge, of what the time is a slippery slope that plan into a large war in the Middle East. It's time for Congress to debate these issues fully, which it has not done and hasn't yet been asked to do. But it doesn't have to be asked by the president. That debate should be going on now. But to be any use, it has to be an informed debate. It can't be limited to the lies of government officials or the silence. It has to rely on the kind of whistleblowers that did not exist to keep us out of Vietnam or Iraq. It was a lack of such whistleblowers that gave us those wars. And we need those whistleblowers right now. We need another Edward Snowden and many more of them, and Chelsea Manning, to inform Congress as to what this country is being asked to do. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you for all the work you um, It's been 40 years. You could have, you could have laid back a long time ago, and you keep on going. What keeps you going? What? Well, as I tell people, they keep doing it, so I keep doing it. Uh, we're seeing the same kinds of wars come again. This is not a part of my life that I look forward to reliving. But it's happening again. It's Groundhog Day again. 
And the worst of it is, I wouldn't regret living my own life again exactly as it was, with no change. But the thought that that involves the victims of these policies uh, being victimized and tortured again in needless wars and wrongful wars, that's unbearable.